Let's start today's lecture. So today we are going to discuss about unsupervised learning. And itself is an important topic with wide applications in different industries. And even in like natural language processing, there are a lot of techniques are based on unsupervised learning. But today's lecture is based in a way that uh, one o'clock, uh, Bernard is going to give his uh, afternoon lecture. So we, we can afford to, to be late, just let you know. And today's on my learning lecture, we are going to talk about two topics and three different uh, models. The first is actually PCA, principal component analysis, and we'll talk about its motivation from the geometric side. So PCA is actually a tool in linear algebra. So for those math guys, you should have been able to learn it I mean, with an entry-level undergrad course. But for the rest of us, we want to emphasize the geometric motivation. And then at the end, we'll uh, talk about the mathematical formulation, a little bit linear algebra. Then we talk about clustering. And the two classical clustering techniques we talk about are k-mean and hierarchical clustering. So because there are two topics, we'll run two different lecture code sections after the lecture. So first, let's actually review what's the supervised learning. So the task is to predict the value of one or more response variables from a given set of predictor variables. And the predictions are based on the training data of previous solved cases. Namely, the human need to provide the correct label the correct value and teach the machine and how to see the pattern. And after get trained, the machine should be able to spit out the unknown or unseen target for the test set. And performance can be estimated by some loss function. Usually it's RSS in regression or cascading error or all back error. And the OB means the all back error in the uh, bagging or random forest. So in classification, you usually use the classification error as a gauge. And then you use the trend test split or cross validation to justify there's no overfit. For regression, there are simple multiple linear regression and regression tree, etc. And there are also SVR, the four vector regressor. And there are also a tons of nonlinear regression. Uh, grandfather by the simple linear regression. In classification, there's a so-called logic regression, discrete analysis, naive Bayes, support vector machines, and classification tree, etc. And there are actually a lot more other algorithms which were not in our uh, syllabus. But on the other hand, I mean, when you go into the advanced like uh, uh, NLP type of application, in neural network deep learning, there are a lot of applications depend on classification. So in real world, I think in finance, people use uh, regression a lot, but uh, in general business application, classification is probably more important to you. What happened to so-called unsupervised learning? What's the difference between the supervised learning and the so-called unsupervised learning? The major difference is that in the so-called unsupervised learning, there's no teacher, there's no correct answer. Only a set of observations with key features and no response variable. And this is actually kind of good and bad. The good point is that because of that, it's much easier data for unsupervised learning. Because the human doesn't need to label or provide the correct outcome. And therefore, there are a lot of data out there. But because of the lack of response variables, the success or failure of the learning algorithm becomes subjective. And the goal is to infer the property directly without knowing the correct answer or the error for each observation. And it's also called learning without a teacher. And therefore, there's no direct measure of success. And this type of learning technique is probably not emphasized too much in cargo, but it's also very important in the industry. We discussed two different methods. One is called PCA, which is often used for data visualization. 
all, all the data preprocessing for supervised learning. The PCA alone is not particularly powerful, but if you combine it with the supervised methods like regression or classification, it can play a very important role. And since type of technique we discussed is clustering, a broad class of methods, and we mentioned already, there are probably 4,000 different clustering techniques out there in the literature, and we only talk about two. We mentioned unlabeled data is easier to obtain than labeled data. That means uh, the industry beings can collect data directly trained by unsupervised methods. And there's no need for the human labor. And there's no specific prediction goal, and therefore more subjective. And is that example we consider, these are more or less real life examples in the industries that consider a group of online shoppers categorized by their browsing and the purchase history. So suppose you have a whole bunch of uh, shoppers in your database. How do you segment them into different sectors? Segments. Maybe for the marketing strategy, you want to decide the same offer to some of them. But then you know that a lot of them won't respond if it's not fit to their need. So you want to, I won't say classify, you want to categorize your customer. And this is a very important application in data mining. And uh, in, for travel agents, for Amazon or whatever uh, industries which are customer facing, this is actually a very important concept. And second, if you want to group the movie by the comments given by the movie reviewer. So the comments are usually written by the humans and therefore involve NLP. So how do you use the natural language processing techniques, maybe the back of words or more advanced engrams model to separate out the movie based on their comments? on a human being. Maybe some depend on the movie types, it's called Tuppy model, or maybe some kind of uh, assessment that are good or bad about sentiment. So how do you do this kind of thing? And uh, there are techniques related to cross analysis which can handle that. So first we want to talk about the so-called PCA, the principal component analysis. But for those of you which, uh, who are not mathematical inclined, so you will try to link to a geometric side of our lecture. But we will talk about a little bit about the algebra behind the, the thing as well in the second part. The motivation, first, is about multicoinality. We know that in linear models, multicoinality is the abstraction for the multiple linear model to succeed. Why? Because multi-coinality will introduce artificial relationship between different coefficients. And the, reg the regression coefficient you estimate, even though it's 100% based on data, you can swear it's data driven, but often it could be very far away from the true coefficient, even if the data is guaranteed to come from linear model. So this is one problem that we often want to solve. And uh, we put a few remark over here. The regression coefficient of highly correlated variables may be inaccurate. And that means the so-called model variance will be large. By model variance, we mean in the linear model uh, framework, it's just a standard error of your coefficient will be very wide. And the estimation of one variable's impact on the dependent variable, where control the rest, tend to be less precise. This is actually the replacement of the so-called uh, coefficient estimation. Why do you want to estimate the coefficient of a linear model? Because you want to see how does that particular feature affect or impact the target variable, fixing the other. Even though you get a coefficient, but it don't tell you a true story. Because the true coefficient that you don't know is actually usually lie inside the confidence interval from the center, which is what you estimate. What the true value is, you don't know. But if you 
how the interval is very wide. Pretty much you have no knowledge about what is the true coefficient. And therefore, if you report using your estimation made to your boss or to make decision on that, it will usually would be off. And also, I mentioned the standard error of the coefficient tend to be very large. And it also can ruin your model by creating overfitting. Why? Because in your data, you look at a train set, and you learn from the train set, and everything looks very fine, very well, because your coefficient looks nice. But because the coefficient doesn't, doesn't represent the true model coefficient that you yet to define out, then when you go to a test set, you'd be totally off. So this is reflect in the overfitting. So multicoordinality actually is a phenomena we need to deal with. The second issue is about the curse of dimensionality. We already mentioned in our class that most of the machine learning model doesn't work well in high dimension. And the reason is that in one dimension, it's so crowded together and it's so packed together, all the points are kind of adjacent to each other. In two dimensions, it's just slightly uh, less packed, less sparse. But if you go to three dimensions or four dimensions, the same amount of data will become very sparse in high dimension. Namely, if you look at a small neighborhood of the H sample point, there's almost no neighbor. If the model is probably based, you are estimating, you are going to estimate the probability density with no neighbors, only one sample in that neighborhood. So that kind of estimation is kind of true there. If you are doing a KNN, I'm going to find neighbors very, very far away. And that kind of neighbor doesn't re represent my behavior very well. So most of the model have problems when you go to high dimension. And statisticians uh, name it the curse of dimensionality. Therefore, high dimensional data set often is a challenge to the machine learning. And in the linear discriminant analysis lecture, we also talk about if you have high feature dimension, the estimation of your covariate matrix would be very difficult based on a finite number of samples. And we also talk about the so called sample complexity. All the machine learning uh, algorithms have certain kind of threshold sample complexity. Let me, below that threshold, it's not going to function. If you increase the dimension of your features, you are going to drastically increase the sample complexity, such that given a fixed number of samples, you just fall below the threshold and make that kind of uh, algorithm use that. Any question? Yes? What is the Pardon? Oh, why do you consider high dimension? Because the data sometimes naturally we come with high dimension, right? So suppose you get a data frame, and data frame sometimes has 1,000 columns. So automatically, you need to consider 1,000 dimension. And at first, you do not know which feature is important to you. Then you need to do feature selection to kind of select what's the important one. So the, this suggests you that most of the time, when you encounter a data set which has a lot of columns, 1,000 columns, you throw it in a machine learning algorithm. Most of the time, it won't work. It's okay? No, you have to drop the dimension, but how do you drop it? How do you do the feature selection? This is actually what you are trying to do in your project. You have to either throw away some of the features or find combination of features. You replace maybe 100 features by some kind of combination, linear combination or nonlinear combination. So in that way, 100 features become one new feature. You create a new feature out of the old one. So at the end, no matter what to do, you need to drop the dimension down. But another way to do it is by PCA. PCA offers you a way to drop the dimension systematically. But the, the only actually model we know of which violates or kind of the intuition of personal dimensionality is SVN. 
the supervised machine take advantage of the curse of dimensionality. It actually want to live in high dimension. You start with low dimension, you map it to high dimension. Why is it possible? Because the maximum margin we talked about the other day will make the complexity low. So it start, if you go to high dimension, complexity should be very high, but if you tilt it to the maximum margin, you drop the complexity down again. So in that way, it can bypass the so-called curse of dimensionality. What about PCA? Principal component analysis. The ideal input variables are linearly uncorrelated, low dimensional in the field space. If you use this as criterion to do machine learning, almost no data set, real world data set will fit this condition. Most of the data set, when you get it, different features are naturally correlated. And your job is to find out how do you overcome the problem of multi coordinality and still find out useful insight from the data set. And especially most, most of the time, when you collect the data, you don't know which one is important. They are generally very high dimension. And PCA is a tool which can find a sequence of linear combination of the variable to convert as a set of observation of possibly correlated variable into a set of value of linearly uncorrelated variable called principal component. So PCA is a way to change your features such that the original features, they tend to be correlated. Correlated means if one go up, the other one tend to go up. One go down, the other one tend to go down. But PCA creates some kind of magic such that in the so-called rotated or transformed features, the other one go, one go up, the other one go up or go down. It's not clear. In that way, you drop the multi coordinate Is it clear? So that's the goal. And if you only choose, acquire only a few principal components, you will drop the dimension and automatically make it low dimension. So that's the goal. And how do you achieve? Let's look at the geometry. So in this toy data set, yes? Yeah, you can, you can apply this to categorical as well. But for categorical variables, the traditional PCA, sometimes it doesn't give you good results because the distribution of your data is, is off. But there are specific uh, PC variation of PCA which deal with uh, discrete data. Yeah. So suppose you consider a data set live in one dimension just like this. There are only five data points. So apparently this is a toy data set live in two dimensions. The first coordinate range from 0 0.2 to, to 1, and the second coordinate only takes the value 0 0.2. So in this case, it looks like if you look at the data frame of this guy, it looks like you are using two different columns. For this point, I'm going to look at 0 0.3 as the first entry, 0 0.2 as the second entry, 0 0.5 as the first entry, 0 0.2 as the second entry, etc. So you are using two columns to describe the data. But it's obvious to us geometrically that we don't need all the features. In this case, you probably say, well, the second feature is kind of redundant. Everything in the column is 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. You say, why bother? You just throw it away. The process of throwing away ge geometrically is called dimension reduction. Dimensional re reduction. This is actually a way to do feature selection. But you just do it intuitively. Because you think, well, this is 0 0.2, everything is 0 0.2. Why bother? I just drop it. Because this second axis, even though it's there, it contains no additional information. Therefore, it's safe to just record this 0 0.2 as the average, and then save it and drop the second column. And you only use the first column to do your training. What's the benefit? If you do the original question, is a two-dimensional problem, now become one dimension, it's be easier to solve. But what if you have a modified data set like this? Here again, five different data points. And uh, uh, now the difference is that the y-axis is not constant anymore. The different points correspond to different y-coordinates. But still they vary slightly. They fluctuate around 0.2. 
But in this case, the same argument or intuition still works. If you look at the data frame directly, you will report most of the variation comes on the first axis. And the second axis actually are small population. In the case that, that the value only fluctuates around a mean value, you could guess, but you could be wrong, that the second axis are produced by some kind of noise. If you believe that, what you will do is to project all the points back to the x-axis. How do you project? You use a y-axis as your yardstick and try to project everything back to x-axis. This is called orthogonal projection. How do we know it's orthogonal projection? Because if you project in this way, using the red line, the angle are always right angle over here. This is called orthogonal projection. Once you do that, you produce a new cell data from the red points over here, five of them, sitting on the x-axis. Then you train your model based on this new cell data instead of the original one. Is the concept clear? Instead of using the original data set to train a model, we haven't specified which model to use, but then you project your point back to the x-axis and use this replacement to train your model. In contrast, if you do a, another orthogonal projection of the same point, five points, project to y axis, then you will find that the image are accumulating near 0 0.2. They fluctuate around 0 0.2. And you, you don't think that it's so important because all the y components are about the same. Now, this is not insignificant. Maybe the recording error because if the X and Y correspond to some kind of instrument measurement, in your instrument could be oversensitive and produce fluctuation, even though it should be constant. Even if you look at the temperature gauge, and it will fluctuate around, even though the room temperature is constant, because the instrument itself has some kind of sensitivity. They say, well, because it looks like a small fluctuation, maybe it's caused by your measurement error or human error, etc. And then you brush it away. So this is what you do. And this actually motivates the geometric idea of PTA. You are searching for, among all the possible directions in the feature space, the direction along which the projection of the observation are, all, are most widely spread. The widely spread is the geometric term, but the teacher would say, we want to find the direction whose so-called variance or standard deviation is largest. We emphasize the motivation discussed about can be a little misleading because in two-dimensional space, we can have infinite many directions to consider. By this, we mean we, only, we don't only consider x axis and y axis, but instead, you can use the diagonal line or whatever the slope you consider and project to that direction. So there's no reason to only consider x and y direction, but we simplify the discussion. So in general, you need to consider infinite many directions in order to find the best one. By what sense? In the sense that the observation, after you project to that direction, become more widely spread. So below, we are going to give you a three-dimensional example. But in general, the power of algebra allows you to work PCA, even though the visualization cannot go beyond three dimensions. But to illustrate the idea, we will use 20 observations and three features. That means in R3, three dimensions. So this is a scenario that we have the source center as origin over here. So this point, the brick dot, represents origin. And we have 20 different points from a 3D scatter plot. We visualized before, the black dot is actually the origin. Among these 20 points, we want to ask, there are many different directions we can choose, and there are two examples. One is the blue line, and one is the orange line. And there are infinite many of them. You should imagine that uh, you can use a finger to point to opposite direction, starting from origin, and whatever direction you point to, you can ask whether the, the data set 
projecting to this direction is widespread or not. So we want to visualize how do we compare the importance of each direction. By importance, we mean the widest spread is better. Which direction will make the data set more widespread if you project to that direction? So notice these two directions are not parallel to the coordinate axis. So they are, at this moment, look random to us. What you can do if you want to project to the orange line direction is that given the any up 20 sample points over here, you can project orthogonally to the orange line. And the line, the orange line over here, represents orthogonal projection. So even though it look, doesn't look like a 90 degree angle because it's in 3D, but actually it's orthogonal. If you do that for 20, all 20 samples over here, you will find that all 20 samples are project along some straight line and then on into the orange line. And there are 20 new samples dot by the orange dot in the orange line. Is it clear? It's by the so-called orthogonal projection. Once you project down, you can measure how widespread is the projected data. So in doing a projection, you are collapsing some unwanted dimension down. And therefore, you change the behavior of your data set. So the original data set is widespread. But now if you project to this particular direction, it bec the spread becomes like this. And mathematically, the spread is gauged by standard deviation. Or if you take square, it becomes its variance. So which one will give you a better variance? So you can try to do a projection to the full line as well. Again, projecting another 20 points. And now you can put them together and compare. And this is the orange one and there's the blue one. Which one wins? So it's clear that the blue one will have a higher standard center error or variance than the orange one. Yes? In doing PCA, this is a Jacob asked a very good question. Whether you want to normalize your feature or not? And the answer is yes and no. The naive PCA does not normalize the feature. But the variance of PCA, which does normalize the feature? And sometimes people call it factor analysis. And uh, it depends on the scenario. In the lecture code, we'll show you examples that if you don't normalize, the result would be very poor. But by default, we don't want to normalize. Why not? Because supposedly, you come from a data, data frame, collecting features from different dimensions, different uh, directions. Their natural units are different. And uh, it may carry information. And then you don't want to normalize it. If you even normalize it, you are kind of already scaled down maybe the most important direction, two of the equal way as the unimportant one. And that or, or, or operation may ruin your model. Yes, so the, 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 this is much more subtle. So at the end, it depends on your understanding about the data to determine whether it's a good idea to, to do. But before, it's not to do it. Yes? Yeah, we are talking about PCA over here. Only for, no, I'm not talking about unknown line everywhere. I'm talking about unknown line in PCA. But yeah, situation you need to normalize. It's content dependent. But that's a good question. The blue direction about is actually the physical first loading vector. So it's not accident. The blue one, we did not pick by accident. So this direction is usually called the first loading vector. Somebody call it first eigenvector or the first, uh, first principal direction, which means it's a direction into which the projection of the other direction is mostly widespread than all the other possible projections to other directions. Being a direction, it has as many entries as the number of the features. So let's go first principal 
direction, or some might call first loading vector, and some math guy like to say first eigen vector. Eigen is come from German. Is actually a of dimension three, three dimension. It point to this direction or this direction. It doesn't matter. So it's only one this one one dimension. It's described by three in this example. Thank <laughs> you.